It is so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Welcome to Beltline. We are glad that you have chosen to be here with us, excited about the day, excited about diving into this lesson today. Lesson two in this series that we started last week talking about courage. And last time we talked about the culture we live in and how we are really leaving behind what might be the most unusual period in human history for God's people. And we're entering into what we talked about last week and what we called the age of unbelief. And when we stop and think about it, it is the most unusual time in human history because throughout time, Christians have rarely been at the center of cultural and political power. It is a very, very, very rare thing for that to happen. In fact, the very roots of the church grew from the soil of a Roman empire that attempted to try to stamp out the faith, didn't it? We know from history that those early Romans would feed Christians to lions. They would put them in prison. They would crucify them upside down. They would even boil them alive. All of that and more. And yet, Christianity thrived in that culture. It grew and it flourished and it grew and it flourished. If you look to the book of Acts, you can see that it started with 3,000 people and then it was 5,000 and then they quit counting. They just said multitudes upon multitudes were coming in the midst of that culture. And why? Why did they thrive? They had an amazing courage and they had God. You see, courage is something that is far easier to talk about than it is to actually live out. It's always easier to live out of fear of one kind or another. But let me just remind you this about fear this morning. Fear never changed anything for the better. I can't think of one thing in my life that I was afraid of that I think, wow, I'm so glad I was afraid of that. Fear never changes anything for the better. Not only that, fear never keeps the church standing firm. It never does, ever. Fear never produces joy. And most of all, fear won't free us to live positively and confidently and Christianly when we are being pushed to the margins like we are right now. And so what is the answer? The answer is, well, we just, we just need to junk our fears and replace them with courage, right? Wrong. That's not the answer. Here's, here's this, a fantastic quote that I found as I was preparing for this lesson that I absolutely love. I want you to hear this because I think this, this to me sums up what we're talking about. Here's what this quote says. Courage is not the absence of fear. And so it's not we're just throwing fear out and we're going to be courageous. No, no, no. Fear, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is more important than our fear. Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is more important than our fear. I love that. And to me, that is so very helpful. Because we tend to think of courage as the lack of fear, but that's just not true. In fact, I'm starting to believe that if there is no fear, I don't know that there can actually be courage. If you're not afraid of something first, man, you, uh, somewhat you have to feel fear to be courageous, right? Real courage takes place when you are anxious, when you are worried, when you don't know how to push through, but you understand that there's something more valuable, something better, something greater than your fear, and so you march ahead anyway. So though you feel fear, your actions are not driven by fear. They are directed by something else. And so you step out with courage because there's something greater that drives you. Someone, someone, or something that is greater than what you are afraid of. That is real courage. And I want you to think about this historically with me for a second. When the culture seemed to be behind the church, when we were what was known as the moral majority, it was kind of easy to take a stand, wasn't it? We stood boldly, we stood firmly, because we assumed that the culture agreed with us. We, we would say, well, that's a really bad thing. And 90% of our culture would say, you know what, that's right, that really is a bad thing. And so in many of those days, and in so many ways, it didn't require courage to be a follower of Jesus. But here's the truth that you already know, those days are long gone. Those days are far behind us. 
And we know that we are no longer a moral majority. And given this sweeping shift in our society, there's a whole lot of people in our world who are going to cave into the culture at some point or another because they are afraid of being seen as irrelevant or not being worthy of respect or something like that. They're going to consume the culture like we talked about last week. Still, other people are going to be angry and frustrated and they're going to spend their waking hours trying to move us back to the moral majority and they're going to attempt to convert this culture to something that it was in days gone by. And still others will avoid the culture altogether, create little subcultures and do their own thing when it comes to art and education and commerce and politics and they're going to simply condemn the culture. But as we said last week, none of those is really an option for us as the church. And I'm here to tell you today, if, if we are directed by courage, then we will be able to walk forward positively, we'll be able to walk forward faithfully, and we'll be able to walk forward joyfully. The question then becomes with this, where do we find that kind of courage? In the midst of a society and a culture that has drastically shifted and, and Christianity is being pushed to the margins, where do we find that kind of courage? What will be the basis of our courage when we are not seen as the sane ones anymore? What will be the basis of our courage when we are not seen as the compassionate ones anymore? What will be the basis of our courage when we're not seen as the loving and gracious ones anymore? Because that's where we are. I hope you understand that today. Our culture has adopted the mindset that to disagree is to hate. That's where we live, right here, right now. To disagree is to hate. And so if we're going to have any kind of courage whatsoever, the only place we can find it is by knowing God. If we are going to have courage... We have to know God. And so let me tell you about this great God that we just sang about for the last half hour. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. One of my all-time favorite passages of Scripture is found in verse 31 through the end of the chapter. And I want to spend some time here today in Romans. And let me just say this before we read. If you're ever feeling maybe a little inadequate or insufficient because of your failures in your life, maybe struggles and weaknesses that you're going through right now, I think it's always helpful to remember the Apostle Paul. He was a man who has quite a story, isn't he? He's a man who hated Christians and hated Christ and who had set his face to try to destroy it all. Who, according to his own words, was a murderer and a torturer and a violent blasphemer. And yet, he was one who became the greatest missionary the Christian faith has ever known. And it just shows me that God isn't always looking for polished perfection, is he? He's not looking for purple, perfect purple people. He's not looking for perfect people. I'm sure he'll take purple people as well. But God has always worked through people who know they are sinners and who are amazed that they have been saved. Paul's letter to the Romans was addressed to a church long before the rulers of the Roman Empire shifted in favor of the Christian faith. Now, the, the people that Paul is writing to were believers living in a period when persecution was beginning to rise and when, in the not-too-distant future, Christians would be burned alive and fed to lions. That's the audience that Paul is writing to. That's the audience of this epistle. And I'm not saying that I, that, that I think things will get that bad again. I sure hope that they don't. But as we move more and more toward a society where Christianity seems to have no place, especially in the public square, the context of these early believers being mocked and mistreated for their faith should begin to resonate with us a little bit more every single day that we live in this world. So listen to what he says to these people in that culture at that time. Verse 31, Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he to, to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised and who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
And then he goes into this long list. Shall, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword. All of these things that are happening to them and are going to happen to them on a greater basis. He says, are any of those things going to separate you from Christ? He says, no. For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, he says, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I can't tell you enough how significant it is to read these words through the eyes of Christians whose stuff was being stolen simply because they had faith in Jesus Christ. Whose career prospects were being thrown out simply because they had faith in Jesus Christ. That the people to whom imprisonment was a very realistic possibility simply because of their faith. Do you understand the temptations that these Roman Christians must have faced? Do you understand the temptations that they must have felt to just go with the flow, to go along, to get along, to, to try to condemn the cult? I mean, think about the temptation it must have been for them. But Paul wants them to live with courage. He wants them to live with courage that knowing they are more than conquerors. And why are they more than conquerors? They're more than conquerors because they are infinitely and unstoppably loved by God. That is where Paul wants their courage to rise up. He says, you are more than conquerors because you are infinitely and unstoppably loved by God. Look just a few chapters later in Romans chapter 11. Scott read this a second ago, but let's read it again together. Verse 33 of Romans chapter 11. Paul says, oh, the depth and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of Christ? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. We have a tendency, if we're honest, of looking for confidence within ourselves, right? If I can just man up here, if I can just pull myself up by my own bootstraps, if I can just do something a little bit different, then it's going to be different. And that's crazy talk, and that's why Paul says what he says here. Paul is pleading with that Roman church in the context that they live with, and he's pleading with us to get our eyes off of ourselves and to put them on to God. Why? Because that's how you get courage. You look at this amazing God that we serve. You get courage when you look at God. And so in Romans 11, Paul starts by talking about God's riches. And to us, that may seem like so random if, if you're really looking at it. But when we think about the fact that his original audience was living under extreme persecution, this, this, this phraseology that he uses here in Romans 11 begins to make sense. When you understand the extreme persecution they were going through, it makes sense. Let me try to help us relate this just a little bit more. I think every single one of us, I won't ask for a show of hands, probably understands and knows and realizes the stresses that come when finances aren't quite what they should be or what we hope they would be, right? We, we understand the stress that comes with that. For most of us, that's trying to live within our means. It's trying to balance the budget, so to speak. But did you know that right now, not only in the United States, but in the United Kingdom, there are Christian business owners, or maybe I should say ex-business owners, who are already literally counting the cost of holding faithfully to Christ because they refuse to serve someone because of their faith or they refuse to do something because of their faith and they are counting the cost right now. And thinking about our riches and or lack of those riches is going to conquer us with fear. We're going to be conquered by fear if we're only thinking about us. And so Paul says, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about God's riches. Stop thinking about your stuff. Don't look at you. Look at God. And the first thing that he says is look at the riches of God. Because number one, God is unspeakably rich. Rich. 
unspeakably rich. As human beings made in the image of God, we can only create what we can afford, right? I, I, we can only create uh, out of what already exists and what we have access to. In other words, you and I are limited in what we can build by what we have resources for, right? But that's not how God works. He is unspeakably rich. That's not how he rolls at all. The creation narrative of Genesis 1 and 2 is not a story about how God lived in heaven and things were getting a little tough and a little tight and so out of necessity, heaven's too packed, I need a place to put all my stuff and so let me go ahead and create the universe. No, there was nothing until God told there to be something. Think about it, it just blows my mind when I think about that. There was nothing until God told there to be something. God says in Genesis 1.3, Genesis 1.6, Genesis 1.14, Genesis 1.26, let us make man or let us do this or let there be and there was. And that word that Jesus spoke in Genesis chapter 1 was so powerful that the universe not only came into existence but continues to expand even up to this day at this very moment. And I know one thing right now, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that, right? I don't care how much you make. I don't care how much you have. You can't do anything like that instantly. You are constrained. It is only God who doesn't need anything and can just speak as much as he wants or anything he wants into existence from nothing. He just tells it to be and he has it. That's a kind of wealth we cannot comprehend. But it's a wealth that belongs to our triune God. And that means it's part of what Paul is talking about. God the Father, through his Son and by his Spirit, is going to share all of his riches with his children. Do you understand that today? And I'm not talking about dollars and cents here. I'm talking about his riches, his vastness, his unspeakable riches. And so Paul encourages us to avoid, don't, don't just put your head down, he says. Don't just do everything you can to keep your money safe and your possessions intact. No, he reminds us that it doesn't matter what is taken from us. And think about the context. As these Christians in Rome are being abused and stuff is being stolen simply because their faith, he says that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, he says. It doesn't ultimately matter if we end up broke. It doesn't matter if we end up in prison because the wealth of God is immense and it is eternally ours in Jesus Christ. And so appreciating our Father's richness gives us a courage that hopefully is going to conquer our fears of what we may lose in the here and now. Did you hear what I said to you? I don't think you really believe me. I don't think you really believe that there's going to come a day in the not too distant future where you're going to lose stuff simply because of your faith. I don't think you believe that. I hope that you will wake up to the truth that it's coming. In fact, it's already here. It just hadn't hit you yet. And what you need is this courage that we're talking about today that when it does hit, you don't go crazy because your stuff's being taken and you remember who is really in control and who's really in charge and that is our God who is unspeakably rich and he says, I got you. I got this. Let them take whatever they want. I got you. But that's not all. Paul goes on to put our eyes on the wisdom and knowledge of God. Do you see it there in verse 33? Oh, the depth of the riches, he says. Yes, he's unspeakably rich. And then he says this, and wisdom and knowledge of God. So this is number two. God is infinitely, infinitely knowledgeable. And you say, Steve, how in the world does that give me courage? Why would I want to put my eyes on that truth? Well, let me tell you. You see, Paul wants those Christians in Rome to think about the truth that God knows what is coming because he's actually planned what is coming. Paul wants them to consider what things could look like 10, 20, 100, 1,000, 10,000 years later as he's writing to these believers in Rome. And I need you to know that they couldn't fathom the end of the Roman Empire when Paul was writing this letter to them. This was something they could not possibly comprehend. History tells us that their houses were literally built in what was known as the eternal city. 
We know from history at this moment in time, Rome stood as the pinnacle of its might in this period. And Paul's readers would not have been able to imagine that ever changing. But here's the truth. There is no Roman Empire today, is there? In fact, if you can afford it, you can fly over there, pay a few bucks, and you can walk through the ruins they never in that generation, in that culture, in that context could have fathomed that Rome would no longer be there, but it's gone. And the point is that God who sees all and knows all is managing things in ways that you and I don't understand. God plays what I like to call the long game. And we need to hear this because we live in a culture that doesn't value the long game at all. No, ours is a digital throwaway culture of instant information and instant gratification and we struggle to see the big picture, the long game that God is playing. We want everything and we want it now. We want it quickly, but that's not how God works. And let me just make this very clear for you. The Lord will not become a slave to our cultural assumptions and our demands. We don't get to tell God what to do and how to do it. He will not become a slave to what our culture thinks he should be. And he will not become a slave to our demands. The best thing we can do is find out what God is doing and join him in that rather than trying to ask God to do what we want him to do. And this is crucial because there is going to come a day when you will be marginalized, when you will be ridiculed, and when you will be oppressed for your faith if it hasn't happened already. And in that moment, the wisdom and knowledge of the Father will be of massive importance to you. When we begin to enter these spaces where we're being kicked out of the mainstay here and to the margins of our world, whether it involves losing friends or struggling to find a job or actually ending up in prison because of your faith, there is going to be a temptation for you to lose hope and to lose trust. When we find ourselves in those places when we're being attacked because of our faith, you, there's going to be a temptation to throw up your hands and say, this is not what I signed up for. But Paul tells the Romans and he tells us, no, in all things, God knows what he is doing. God knows what he's doing. Let me blow your mind for just a second. Do you understand this morning that the future is not a time that God knows about? The future is a place where God already is. Wow. <laughs> Think about that. The future isn't just something God knows about. It's a place where he already is. He is all there in the way that he is all here and in the way that he is all in the farthest reaches of our universe. God exists outside of time and being outside of time, his wisdom and his knowledge is absolutely perfect. And it can't be questioned. And here's why it can't be questioned. Because you and I don't have the intellectual capacity to even know what the right question to ask is to someone who exists so far beyond where we are. We don't know what we don't know. So let me put this another place, another way. To, to tell God that he should do it differently. Right, to do it our way is to step into a three-hour long movie for two seconds and try to tell the director and lecture the director on what the movie's all about and what it's supposed to be. It's crazy, right? We don't know. In Romans 8 and in Romans 11, Paul is reminding us, God knows. God knows. And to Christians experiencing persecution and marginalization, Paul is saying loud and clear, God has not abandoned you. He is saying, man, he has not forgotten you. And so whatever your two-second perspective tells you, you have to remember that God has a depth and a length of wisdom and knowledge that you can't even start to comprehend. That's why we sing, tempted and tried. We're off made to wonder. Why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Farther along. Right? The song is trying to teach us that God's in control of all this and he understands that in the moment we may not get it, but that doesn't mean we let go. That means we understand God's playing the long game. We may feel anxious as we head deeper into the age of unbelief. I don't know how long it'll last. 
I don't know how long we'll be there. I don't know how hard it will be or what will come next. But God does. Did you hear me? I may not know, but God does. We know that God is sovereign and infinitely wise and all-knowing. And we can take heart in remembering and believing he has got this That our small slice of human history is just that, a small slice. And God has much, much, much bigger and much, much greater plans in place that will not be stopped and will not be hindered. Just as he told Peter in Matthew chapter 16, man, the gates of hell can't even prevail against the plans that God has for his church. God is unspeakably rich. He is infinitely knowledgeable. And that leads Paul to do what really... In our culture today is the unforgivable sin. That's what it does. In our culture, the unforgivable sin is think less of yourself. And yet that is what Paul asks us to do based on the riches and wisdom of God. And, And it's unforgivable in our society to think less of ourselves. But that's exactly what Paul wants us to do. He says, I want you to feel lower and smaller and weaker than you naturally do. And I know that sounds crazy, right? Especially in a season of difficulty to embrace this feeling of feeling weak and small. But in God's economy, in God's economy, to lack confidence in yourself is the first and necessary stage in gaining confidence in God. Did you hear me? Humble yourself and he will lift you up. How many scriptures do we have where that is exactly what the text says to us? And I think this is where the church has made a big mistake. I think we have spent years telling each other, you can do it, you can do it, (laughs) you're so great. Be yourself, find yourself, believe in yourself. Our teaching and advice has been based more on the false wisdom of the world than the true wisdom of the word of God. Because to live with real courage requires us to live with the right assessment of our own weakness. To live with real courage requires us to live with the right assessment of our own weakness. It requires us to measure ourselves against the Lord and realize how very, very small we are. And I think that's what Paul's getting at in verse 34 of Romans 11. When he says, who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? And there's none of us that can answer this. And I have to believe that when this epistle was being read aloud to the church in Rome, when they reached this part of the letter, there was no one that said, "Uh, excuse me there, just a second reader. Uh, I actually know the mind of the Lord. (laughs) And there wasn't somebody that interrupted him and said, you know, I actually gave God a gift and he kind of owes me something right now. Right? None of that happened. No, you could have heard a pin drop when those words were being read. There was silence because no one on earth knows or understands the ways of God enough to counsel him. He doesn't need us and he owes none of us anything. God doesn't owe you anything. You have nothing to give him that is not already his. And I love how C.S. Lewis says this in his book, Mere Christianity. He says this, to try to give anything to God is like getting six pence from your grandfather and buying him a gift and bringing it back to him. The grandfather is six pence, none the richer. Right? What is he saying? Hey, Grandpa gives you some money and you go buy Grandpa a gift and you bring it back to him. I'm sure Grandpa's thrilled that you thought of him and you bought him a gift. But the bottom line is he's still out six pence, isn't he? Right? That's how it is with us trying to give anything to God. Everything you have has been given to you by God for the glory of God. You can't now leverage it to put God in your debt. That doesn't make any sense. And whenever you start to feel that welling up in you, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? That feeling that you deserve better? Come on. Come on. We've been there. When that, hey, whoa, feeling, what's going on here, God? When that feeling starts to well up in us, understand that's based on the view that you think you've somehow made God owe you. God doesn't owe you anything. And here's why that's so important. Because that means 
everything that we have been given is a gift from God and is worthy of us worshiping and praising and honoring the one who gave it to us. Are you following me this morning? When we begin to get a handle on this God, when we get a glimpse of this God, all we can and should do is realize how small we are and how great he is. And then our words are going to echo what Paul's are here in verse 36 when he says, For fruit from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. When we begin to get a handle on the greatness of God, when we begin to get a, then we begin to get a great God-given, God-sized courage. When we take our eyes off of ourselves and look to the glory and wisdom and riches of God, we are given strength and we are given hope. And when we look to God, we get courage to live for God. And so if you're living a, a, a very cowardly life in your faith right now, the problem is you're probably not looking at God. You're probably looking to yourself, using and trusting in your own resources rather than in His. But when we look to God, we get the kind of courage that brings us peace and joy and hope even when we are under pressure. As the civil rights actions started to really heat up and people were being beaten and killed because of the color of their skin and threats were everywhere. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote a sermon called Our God is Able. And this sermon became part of a book called Strength to Love. And here's what the book said. It said, amid hostility and violence, Dr. King said this. And this is a quote from that sermon. It seemed as though I heard an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth. God will be at your side forever. And almost at once, my fears began to pass from me. The outer situation remained the same. But God had given me an inner calm. Three nights later, Dr. King's house, while he was out of town, was bombed. And he says this, strangely enough, I accepted the word of the bombing calmly. My experience with God had given me new strength and trust. I know now that God is able to give us the inner resources to face the storms of life. He's right, isn't he? And here's the truth I want you to take from that. Our God doesn't always take the storms away. He doesn't. And you don't find that kind of courage from looking deep within yourself. It doesn't come from being mad at the world or keeping your head down in the world. No, that kind of faith, that kind of courage comes only from experiencing God. Again, God doesn't make the storms of opposition go away. But he is able to make us stand in the middle of that opposition and in the middle of those storms. He lets us, enables us, and tells us, stand up for righteousness and truth, even in the midst of those times. That's the God-given courage that comes from having a view of the greatness of God, who, by the way, is at our side. We are on his team. And so when you look at the cultural landscape, when you look at the political situation we find ourselves, the economic situation, when you look at the racial divide, global terrorism, when you look at the numbers of churches closing their doors every single week and the mass exodus that's happening of people leaving the church, when you look at the growing hostility toward God and his word, it is really, really easy to feel afraid. But we cannot sit in that fear. We cannot sit in that fear. We cannot let fear grip us or cripple us or rob us of our joy and hold us back from living faithfully. And most of all, we can't allow that fear to stop us from holding up the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is okay to feel fear. That's normal. That's human. We are weak in, after all, aren't we? We are frail after all. But we must not stay in that place. We've got to move beyond it. We've got to lean on something bigger. We've got to find something greater that transcends it. Or maybe I should say we've got to find someone greater that transcends it. 
The courage we need only comes by taking our eyes off of ourselves and placing them firmly on the Lord. And this is not an idea I know that you're going to put on a coffee cup or you're going to wear as a Christian t-shirt. But it is freeing and it is transformational if you will allow it to be. God is far greater. Please get this. God is far greater. He's far more eternal. He's far more sovereign. He's far more wonderful than anything this world can take from you. Did you hear me? He's far greater, far more eternal, far more sovereign, far more wonderful than anything that this world can take from you. We are more than conquerors. Always. Always. Through him who loves us. Courage. That's what we need. Courage. Courage. If we can help you at all today in any possible way, we're here for you. You need to obey the gospel. You need prayers for that courage we've been talking about. I hope today's the day we can lift your name before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Why don't you come while we stand and sing this?